What's up, everybody? Are you? There we go. Get my monitor up so I can check the questions and the comments. How are you, my friend? Happy Thursday. Happy Thursday. 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 Man, time is sure fly. How you like my haircut, Bo? Nice, nice look shot. At, look at that. Look at that scalp. Look at that's that's not scalp. That's that's, all, that's skull, man. No, that's that's hair that that uh, impersonates skin. And you notice on my left, on my okay, this camera is backwards, but on this side, this side is all white. This side is a little more. Well, this side is bald, so or whatever. Anyway, they they call that rat bite. <laughs> <laughs> nice buzz, Liz. You're too nice, but you know we try to be honest on the show. Uh, but I appreciate the, the, the comment. Yeah, Scotty, we come on early uh, every night, actually, to test the system because sometimes we get glitches. Uh, so Charlie and I come on. We have a little bit of fun. Talk star, make sure everything works. Our guests come on at 7, and, uh, and then we take it from there. So, yeah, this is kind of the, the joshing time. You know, we can talk about my haircut or Charlie's beautiful Aloha shirts and everything else but uh, you know we try to try to have some fun in the middle of all this I, you know Charlie I, we've uh, been through so much in our lives and and then you know when you think about what we're going through right now it's like wow I mean well, geez. you know you know what I what I kind of want what what I'm looking for you know this is just a personal preference of mine. You know, I've been one. I, I I made some calls today to some former traffic uh, brothers of mine from the Big Island Police Department. We haven't talked to each other since 1994. Okay, and so they're doing good. They're 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 uh, working on the Big Island in the same company that I'm with. But so we, you know, we're communicating, and it's. Um, but the reason why I mentioned them is because they know me as one. I was one of those in the class that, you know, you're given a formula to work on, right? And instead of start working on a formula, I was always asking questions of the instructors. Why was the formula made that way? Right? Yeah. It's just like, you know, where, where, where did the first whale come from? <laughs> I mean, before there was even water on this earth, something had to say it. I'm going to make a whale. <laughs> so I'm over there thinking, get a lot of whales in the ocean. But I want to know where the first whale came from. And what was it? And how big was it? And was it able to actually breed underwater or the thing had to come up for air because the thing can hold his breath too long? I don't know. But that's the kind of mind. And so now we're into COVID. And I just want to know, why is the damn thing acting the way it is? I mean, is it that... Does it like maybe, you know, like mosquitoes? They'll like only certain rate, like me. They only like me. I can have a, a friend of mine who's all Portuguese standing next to me, and the bugger don't even bite one. And I don't know if because he never take a bath so long, he, he get armor on his skin. I don't know, but they just don't like yeah. him. It's, it's that kind of stuff I'm trying to think. Why do certain things happen the way they do? And you know what? I let, I let my, and, and sorry for saying this, but I let my whole life pass me while I'm over there worrying why certain things happen. That's all. Are you on, everybody? <laughs> so. Hi, Steph. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Well, tonight we're going to have questions, the answers to all those questions, Charlie. I, I have a feeling that tonight we're going to find out where was the first whale. Yep. When it happened, and was it? Did it have legs? Could it breathe? Hang on here. I'm gonna read this, Charlie, because I get bad memory. I have a question, Mel and Charlie. My son-in-law was positive. Just finished quarantine. That's the negative. <coughs> Excuse me. Now my daughter is positive. She's been fully vaccinated. How likely is that the three youngsters will get it in the household, ages three, seven, and eleven? She was sleeping in the parlor with them while dad was isolated in a bedroom. She started symptoms last night. You know, I, I'm gonna, you know, we can ask that 
question of the, everybody's commenting on my hair. You guys all lying. It's not a nice haircut. It's very short. But anyway, thank you all for being so pleasant. No, it's, it's a nice haircut. Yeah, I know. And my dad just said it's a nice haircut. So I know yeah. he's not going to lie. My brother, Gerald, is up in Seattle right now with my dad. Aloha, man. Um, what the heck was I going to say? Oh, uh, as far as the, you know, with this virus, <clears throat> yeah, I just had a, just a message right before the show from a friend of mine who, whose son, adult son, uh, tested positive. And mom and dad never tested positive. They spent a lot of time together. Uh, you know, with this virus, you just never know. Uh, it's hard to say. The chances are if they were isolated, from the, the positive person, completely isolated, then the chances are very great that they won't get, they won't get infected. The question is, you know, how long prior to him finding out that he was positive? The virus sheds sometimes uh, without symptoms. So, you know, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a case by case deal. The best thing is to keep them isolated and, and uh, make sure they have masks, even if they're in the house, make sure they wear masks and they don't, you know, they stay very far away. Uh, but we can ask that of the doctors later. Tonight, we have Dr. Kapono Chong Hansen, Dr. Lee Evslin, and, and uh, Dr. Lee Altenberg. Uh, we got a trifecta tonight. Brother? Tomorrow night, tomorrow night, Dr. Jerome Kim, guys. Uh, so make sure you share that slide that I posted. I'll post it up again tonight. But Dr. Jer uh, Jerome Kim will be here, Director General uh, of the International Vaccine Institute. So. Well, you know, tonight, I hope that when people get some answers that they're looking for, they're going to be filled with satisfaction, or better yet, it satisfies you. So remember the word of the night, satisfies. And for all of you out there that know Uncle Charlie, throughout the night, I'll be munching on this Snickers candy bar throughout the night, okay? Because it satisfies. You know, we... we Patsy brought back some snacks for you, Charlie. It's all healthy snacks. Yeah, Lorraine, I, you know, I, if you have, you, you should be worried. I mean, you know, we should be not worried sick. If we all, listen, it all comes back to what we've been saying for a very long time. If we all do what we need to do, if we all wear masks, okay, the vaccine's available, you know, but it's, it's really starting to frustrate me about how, uh, how, our leaders are going after those that haven't been vaccinated. You know, they're, they're, there's valid reasons, okay? And we're not gonna get into that debate. If you're not vaccinated, you really gotta be careful. And if uh, you are vaccinated or not vaccinated, we all gotta be careful. So if we all wear a mask, social distance, don't swap spit with people that uh, you have no idea if they're positive or not, which pretty much is everybody, uh, just don't do it. Stay safe. The, the, the way this thing is, is today 63 cases on Kauai today, 20 of them, I think it was 20 of them were kids. And uh, we'll talk about that tonight. We'll, we'll, I'll tell you what, tonight's gonna be full of information. So uh, please get your notepads. And I don't know if we'll be able to get you all the questions because uh, we're, we're gonna, Kapono is gonna start off and then Dr. Uh, Altenberg will go over some new data with, uh, with the new cases and all of that. And then Dr. Ebsen will, will follow up. But, you know, it's, it's scary, <clears throat> Charlie. It's scary and, and you know. No, it's, it's, it's just, it's just. But it's life. It's life. And, and you just uh, got to be disciplined. You know, a lot of people out there, they don't want to admit it. They're not disciplined. Yeah. They, they want to act like King Kong. It's okay. But remember now, even King Kong got shot off the Empire State Building. Never make it all the way to the top. Okay, almost to the top. Yeah. So what I'm saying is the vaccine will minimize the, the symptoms greatly, I believe. But again, I'm one of those, like, I like to see you in my own eyes, right? But right now, time is not on our side. Time is against us because this thing is moving fast. The sooner we understand that, you know, it's, it's like a tidal wave. They say, yeah, it's coming, but, you know, I have enough time. I, I can make it up the hill. Next thing you know, it's going to be right on your okole, and it's going to overrun you. And I've said that before. So when Mel talks about wearing the mask, that's just only one component. Because we all know that the greater majority of this virus goes in your nose, 
into your 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 you know into your breathing passages and it makes house over there that's how you get sick so why not try to minimize why not try to minimize to the point that it cannot get into your nose but yet gonna be somebody out there says well we have the freedom i understand you have the freedom but i'm saying with that freedom comes deadly consequences if you're not using common sense okay such as why would you go into a gunpowder factory and try to light one cigarette because you badly need to smoke one cigarette? Why would you do that? Knowing that the possibility of you blowing up is great. That's all I'm saying. You got to use common sense. Sometimes you got to wait, get far away from that gunpowder factory. Then you can light your cigarette. Better yet, give up smoking. But... Some people cannot, I understand, but use common sense. That's all we're saying. But that's all I'm saying. And that's a great analogy because when you light that cigarette, because you have a right to smoke, right? You have a right to smoke. If you light that cigarette, you're not only going to blow up yourself, Mm -hmm. you're going to blow up other people, people that you may love, people that you may not know. And I think that's the difference with COVID. You know, it's a lot of people believe that they have their individual freedoms, but in this case with COVID, you know, you, when you don't follow the safety protocols, you put others at risk, <clears throat> and it's and it's serious risk, very serious risk. So, you know, tonight I watched the news and I saw the governor and then I saw uh, uh, Blangiardi, and you know, their whole response to this, the Labor Day weekend is. We're going to come after you guys if you guys violate the rule. If we're going to come, we're going to cite you guys and fine you guys. And again, you know, again, the messaging, the messaging. Why are you making, listen, you guys set the rule. I don't care if you visitor, resident, doesn't matter. You violate the rule. You should get cited. Why only on Labor Day weekend? So just because it's a Labor Day weekend now, we're going to, Activate everybody for God and go write tickets because it's the Labor Day weekend and because you guys want to make this three day pause, the request, the, the pleading. Oh, I plead with you guys, please. Please stay home. Don't gather. This is what bothers me, Charlie. They're, they're telling everybody, don't gather. Don't hang out with people. But they never close the school. That's okay. You know, that's why people get hard time. We talked about mixed messaging for the last year. You know, you know remember when, we, when, the, when uh, Lieutenant Governor kept coming out, so you get vaccinated, you will not get the disease. You will to- total immunity. You don't need, you just, people that got ingrained in people's heads. So now when the people are seeing the breakthrough cases and the fact that I think in, in some play areas, 30% of the cases are a breakthrough. Um, that's why they don't trust government. That's why they don't trust government because you came out and convinced people. You didn't just tell, you convinced them because you told them that every single day, sometimes more than once a day. And people were convinced that if you got this vaccine, when we knew that wasn't true, everybody knew it wasn't true, Charlie. We listened to our experts. They they all knew it wasn't true. Nothing is 100%. So now you cause a problem. You cause a problem with the integrity of, of the leadership. And that's a problem. So it's, it's hard to convince people to trust your government when they constantly send out the mixed messages that they continue to do till today. Well, you know, it's funny. It's when you have a criminal testifying as a character witness for someone, they bring up that person's history, how they've conducted themselves prior to. And if they have a history of lying all the time or not stating true facts, they'll expose that on the stand, right? To try to get that person stricken off as a witness, no credibility, right? And I think that's where we're at. There seems to be a question on the credibility. We know that this virus is very credible just by the mere numbers, unless, you know, for those who are on the other side of the coin can prove that those numbers were made up 
we invite you to come on and show us how those numbers were made up and where they were made up and where you got your information from. Because guess what? All the numbers that's being revealed this whole last year and some, we didn't make up the numbers. It was given to us. In fact, we are trying to extract numbers that we knew were hiding in different corners of that building down by Punchbowl, which is called the Department of Health. And our guests are coming in one at a time. There's Dr. Capono. Mm -hmm. Oh, aloha. Aloha. I'm gonna turn the other way. There turn you back. go. Okay, there, there we go, there we go. I guess I'm the first of the three. I'm right behind you. Oh, all right, Bill. We're just waiting for uh, Dr. Altenberg. Mm -hmm. So thank you, gentlemen. We, I mean, we got, uh, we got, we got some um, very respectable people in the house tonight, Charlie. So we got to behave. We need to behave. Oh, I, I'm always behave. It's you the one I worry about, brother. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we talked about the other night, uh, you know, I've been getting questions. Uh, people send me videos all the time from YouTube and all these things. And, I, and I, I, I get asked a lot, you know, Mel, did you see this video? What are your thoughts? I say, well, first of all, I don't know those people. I have no idea what their background is. I have no clue. Uh, I see the video. I could make one just like that. I could put on a, a doctor's smock and, and tell the world whatever I wanted to, but don't make, make it right. I said, the people that I listen to are the people that I trust and I know personally. And uh, you two are two of, of, of many doctors and experts that I trust. I trust you guys seriously with my life. I trusted Dr. Evelyn with my son's life and he did a damn good job with my son. And Capono, we're gonna trust him with Rhonda, Rhonda's life shortly when she gets her vaccine. But that's the difference. You know, I, it's not some random YouTube video that I found when I searched up the problems with the vaccine or how bad is a well, vaccine conspiracy? You know, yeah, if you Google that up in YouTube, you'll find a bunch of experts that you don't know <laughs> that you definitely shouldn't trust. So anyway, how you all doing? I just saw Dr. Altenberg pop in. I'm not sure where he's at. Wait, hang on. Where is he? I wanted to say something real quickly. I, I've always wondered why there are some of those who try to discredit some of the information, knowing that it's only going to go so far. <laughs> and they just continue to go down that path. And I'm just like, well, I guess if that if that's what floats your boat, then I, I, I guess you're on that path. But for the most part, you know, it kind of lose steam after a while unless somebody else picks it up and they start going down that path. And so it gets to a point that you, you try to understand what they're trying to say. And I, I still can't find the facts behind it. You know, we've, we've asked, right, Mel? Yeah. I'm on the show, present the facts and let the world judge it for what it is, right? Then maybe, you know, you could turn some heads, but I, we, haven't had, we haven't had any takers so far. So I, kinda, I guess it kind of tells us something. Is he on there? He's, I see, the, I see him on the screen. Oh, I don't see the, I, I, I don't see the no. video. There, there we go. Hello, Aloha. Yeah, he forgot to turn on his light in his uh, bedroom there. But now he's oh, out in the garden. Yeah. He's in the field. beautiful he's, garden of his. He is in the backyard. And you know no. what? You know what about that garden? I got to tell you, Mel. Like I said before, that garden is mosquito free. I bet you throughout this show, you know, I'm going to get one mosquito bite. You watch. Hey, that's not one garden. That's a <laughs> willy willy forest. Oh. oh. And those are Ilima, native oh. Ilima. Nice, yeah, nice, you, nice. you know, you're making this Hawaiian look bad. I should have known that, but I didn't. <laughs> yeah, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I made it. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it, actually. <laughs> See what happened yeah. when you grew up in a condo your whole life? You, you don't know about <laughs> <this> stuff. <laughs> well, welcome, everybody. Welcome, and thank you for joining us tonight. This is it's an awesome night to have three of you on in the same show. I wish I wish, uh, I wish, wish that the media would have you guys on on a show for a half an hour, an hour, educating the public. But uh, we're blessed to have you guys on, Charlie, and I appreciate you all very much. Um, we have Dr. Kapono Chong Hansen, Dr. Lee Evslin, and of course, Dr. Lee Altenberg tonight. You guys all know them. They've been on our show before. Um, and and uh, we're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn it over to Kapono, Dr. Kapono. 
and uh, you can open up and then we'll we'll go through we discuss via email just to keep it organized so me and charlie don't go ballistic and uh we, we don't want to waste your time and, and we want to get to the core of the matter so capono thanks thanks mel you take it away my friend you take it away well, you know, related to what you said earlier, I, I just did want to mention, you know, I've been honored to care for some of Mel's extended family members and, and informally immediate family members. So, you know, we have connections like that, too. I just took, you know, confirm he, you know, he asked me questions about, you know, medical problems and, and, we, and we try to help out whenever we can. So it's been a good connection, but we've been connected through through family members for a long time and didn't even know it. Yeah, let, let me say this real quick. And I talked about it last night with Miskovich. When I called you about my daughter, I called you, I called Miskovich, I called, I called like five or six of our guests. And I told our guests, all of them said the same thing. So that just leads to the credibility of, of all of you, you folks. So anyway, thank you. Thank you for that. All thank right. You. Well, so um, we all came on tonight because we, we've been associates throughout this pandemic. Um, and it's just been a a, a great uh, opportunity to share knowledge, you know, and I've learned a lot from other people um, in this group. We call it the Kauai COVID-19 discussion group, although it's gone well beyond Kauai as the pandemic evolved, but um, that's how I've connected with these two guys and many others. Um, and so we wanted to talk about some work we did recently. Um, we've been talking for weeks, you know, seeing that this surge was building and hoping that we could influence some of our leaders to um, consider some mitigation measures to prevent us from getting to where we are now. And then Friday, it just sort of, the crisis really, I think, became aware to everybody. You know, people that I associate with through medical practice and then also through public health started contacting me and saying, oh, we got to do something. This can't, you know, we can't let this happen. We're, we're in, in crisis now for various reasons. So I just wanted to go through the most important reasons why we, we, why it's pretty clear that we're in a crisis now. And I think most of this has now been reported in, in the media. Some of it had already been reported before Friday and some of it had not. But um, the biggest one I think you guys probably have heard about is this oxygen shortage. Um, so it's a supply demand mismatch. Um, we just have too much demand right now for um, oxygen and we aren't able to meet the supplies. So that, you know, that is distressing. And um, the bad, well, the good thing about Hawaii with our isolation, like we've talked about, about before, it gives us an opportunity to um, possibly, you know, control pandemics if we uh, intervene when it comes to travel and safety precautions. But the bad thing is that it makes it harder to get resources um, if they're in short supply. So it's a complex issue um, that I, I have to admit, I don't fully understand. It has partly to do with storage for liquid, liquid oxygen and partly to do with our capability to produce oxygen here. Um, but the Healthcare Association of Hawaii started noticing that there was gonna be a shortage if we continue on the same trends that we are. Um, that led to um, statewide calls with the biggest hospital systems to stop doing elective procedures, particularly surgeries in general, particularly because a lot of them require oxygen and we needed the oxygen to care for COVID patients. And of course, the majority of them are unvaccinated COVID patients. So elective procedures were delayed um, because of that. Um, you know, on top of the fact that we have all these hospitals getting full. So Queens had reported that they were full. We know about Queens West, HM, uh, Hilo Medical Center, uh, through their social media, they're pretty public about, you know, the situation that they're in. But on Friday, they had reported, I believe they had an 11-bed ICU that was at capacity, and they had um, makeshift five more beds, ICU beds that, that were operating. So we were noticing, you know, hospitals are at capacity, oxygen is in short supply, elective procedures are now canceled statewide. Um, and so, you know, it doesn't really get more distressing than that. Um, one thing that I learned from a colleague of mine who's a neonatologist at Kapi'olani, um, she pointed out one of the issues with Haima, if you look at the Haima site, they'll say, oh, ICU bed capacity. Today, it says 283 full out of 344. But if you see the fine print below, it says 
it's, it's based on daily hospital reporting. These include NICU and PICU beds. NICU means neonatal intensive care unit. So those are, those are newborn cribs, essentially. You know, I mean, and PICU is pediatric ICU. So um, those are not, at least not one for one, but those, you know, those are not available for the majority of COVID patients who are adults or, or older children, at least. So it gives an artificial picture, I think, of the crisis. But I was kind of always curious, why does that number look like it's not so bad when you're hearing that so many of these hospitals are full in the ICU. So um, that was valuable information for me to hear. And I was like, how many NICU beds are there? And to give you an example, an example, Kapi Olani has 74 NICU beds. She thought maybe Tripler had 20, Kaiser had 20. And some of those are probably full, you know. Uh, you know so I, I don't know exactly what the real count would be if you eliminated those NICU beds, but that number on, on the Hyema site, I think gives a, a, a false impression of, of reserve NICU beds that, it, that is inaccurate um, as far as managing this pandemic. So um, the other thing that we found out was we're starting to have lab issues, uh, you know, issues with lab testing capacity. And I understand that's also a multifactorial. Part of it has to do with staffing issues with people in quarantine, transportation, uh, it's not, necessarily total supply and capacity, but it's just the ability for the whole system to operate. So this week we received notice that outpatient testing was, at least on Kauai, was all going to be sent this, for this is one of the biggest lab companies, the primary lab company used on Kauai, is going to be sent to Oahu. So when you send to Oahu, that means that the results are probably going to take a, a day more, to come, longer to come back than what they had been doing which has a significant impact on pandemics when you have a surge with the Delta variant that spreads so quickly. So these are all just signs that at every level, our healthcare system is, is being pushed beyond capacity. And that if we don't do anything aggressive, then this is gonna keep happening. Now, to be a little bit positive, I have heard that once the notice came out to all the healthcare systems that we need to conserve oxygen, that it opened up some reserve and there are some tentative plans to restart some elective procedures, I believe in a week or so. So there's a little bit of, of positive news there. Um, I think I did mention that we're at an all time high for hospitalizations and uh, ICU hospitalizations as well. So this is the highest it's ever been in, during the pandemic. Um, I did just wanna mention before I pass it over to Lee, I was thinking about this problem and why it resonates with me. And it kind of reminds me of um, a lot of what I do with chronic medicine, uh, chronic conditions in medicine. I'm always trying to convince people to take the, the small measures to prevent the disastrous outcomes before it gets to the, the crisis point. So the example I think of is, you know, my diabetic patients. And sometimes I think of them as sort of being addicted to sugar or addicted to carbs. And I, I keep telling them, you know, we can't keep doing this. If you keep doing it, now we're finding signs of damage to your kidneys. Now we're finding signs of damage to your nerves uh, in, in your feet, you know, which eventually causes, you know, risk of injury and infections. So that's kind of what I see our group doing. We are seeing these signs, trying to come up with um, um, small recommendations early, but now this has festered and none of those small things have been enough. And now we're at the point where we have to be aggressive, kind of like a diabetic where it's like, well, I wish we weren't at that, this point, but now we have to cut off your foot or else, you know, this is going to be a worse situation. And that's kind of the analogy. I, what I think about, we got to this point where we realized and other experts realize that there's nothing short of a stay at home order that is going to change the direction of this right now and stay at home order, uh, amongst the people that I talk to is sort of the preferred term for a lockdown. I guess it makes it sound nicer, but um, you know, a, a lot of people call that a lockdown. So the last thing I wanted to say is that from the modeling that was being predicted um, in, the, um, in a lot of regular media stories from Dr. Chiba, you probably saw them. The other point is that the evidence is not suggesting that this surge is peaking now and gonna come down in the near future. It's looking more like this, this surge is going to continue, maybe peak in October, and maybe start coming down in November. 
but still with case counts, something, you know, 500 to a thousand through, through that time. And that model changes, varies widely. Um, but this is really Lee Altenberg's, you know, he, he's a much more of an expert in that area than me. So I'd like to pass the torch to him. And I, I think he can explain more about the evidence that, that we have about why the stay at home order is needed and how long we could guess it would be needed to really change the trajectory of this surge. I'm happy to talk. Uh, I've got some slides to share. Can I share them? Absolutely, doctor. Go ahead, my friend. Okay, let's see what we got here. Okay, do you see the slides? Let me know when you do. Yep, you got it. You okay, it. so a little bit on the Delta crisis. So where are we with the numbers? Oh, first, uh, I want to announce that some of my colleagues in HIPAM, which is the Hawaii Applied Pandemic Modeling Work Group, are going to be presenting for the Senate COVID Committee tomorrow uh, and at 10 a.m. And the, uh, if you go to the Hawaii Senate's YouTube channel, you'll be able to see that. And this is largely the, the model, the big computational model of Professor Monique Sheba which has, uh, it, it, they're trying to actually take, get all the data they can and actually be predictive. And this is a schematic of um, prior stages of the model. So um, I encourage everybody to go uh, check that out tomorrow. And here is the, the numbers of the, where the Delta surge has been um, for the past, uh, two months since July. And you, can you see that still? Uh, we can see half of it. Oops, all right. Let's see what's going on. There you go. Okay. So this is the cases. And what I've done is, is uh, the natural way that these cases go is exponential growth until something changes in the population. Either people are being more careful or, you, or the virus is running out of people to infect. So it's got a long ways before that it's going to do that in Hawaii. And at the beginning of July, it was doubling every 8.6 days. Okay, so this is a ferocious rate of doubling. Now, you know, it doesn't look as dramatic there because the case numbers are low. But then when it starts by August and it starts to pick up, it's really frightening uh, in terms of increase. But if we look at how it's been about the past month, and it's clearly not growing at that rate. If it was growing at nine days, nine, uh, doubling every nine days, it would be off the chart by now. So it has slowed down, but it has not stopped growing. And looking at uh, the best fit of a, of a second piece, we get that through August, it's gone to about a 35 day doubling time. Okay, so that means if this keeps up, then with our thousand cases today, by, the, by September 30th, we're gonna have 2000 cases a day. So this is clearly not a sustainable situation. So it, it, it's helpful to see what has worked in the past. So uh, we really, to, in order to clear room in the hospitals for the medical healthcare system to function, we have to, reduce the cases dramatically. So we can look at the, the effect of the previous two stay-at-home orders. So here is at the very beginning of the pandemic, March of 2020. It's doubling at, at approximately, I think it was every five days. So that was the R naught of 2.2. Then the stay-at-home order took effect and that produced a 70% reduction in this reproduction number. That's how many people a single person infects. And it brought it down to 0.66. So that means, that means 100 people were only infecting 66. 66 were only infecting, I don't know, what would that be? 40, et cetera, et cetera. And that brought the numbers dramatically down almost as fast as they were going up beforehand. Now let's go a year ago in the summer and we saw a similar rise 
where the reproduction number was 1.7 in late July. And then through August, like now, it's going up, but not as fast. So the reproduction number was 1.1, but it was still going up. And so at this point, August 27th, the governor declared stay-at-home order number two, which was called safer at home. And it was more rational than the first one. And lo and behold, as soon as that went into effect, the numbers plummeted and they were decreasing in half by about every nine days. And then that was a two week stay at home order. And when it ended, the count, so the counts had gotten up to the 300s and then the counts were back into 150 or so. So it was somewhere under half. And then after the stay at home order ended, the numbers didn't go back to what they were before. They kept going down with the additional tier system restrictions that, uh, that the governor had declared. So if this was a model for our, our present situation, then if we had a, uh, another two week stay at home order that would expect to bring the numbers down to about 400 a day, the case, the case numbers. If you went three weeks, it would bring it down to about uh, 300 a day. So it's useful to compare what's happened with Delta here in Hawaii with the original Delta surge, which was in India. And um, so this was, this was the, the beginning of the surge with that reproduction number 1.45. Here we compare it with India and that reproduction number was also very close, 1.4. And that's how they got their huge surge. But then at some point, it reached a peak and it started going down. And so people, a number of people uh, have argued, well, the peak is just around the corner. So we don't need to do anything drastic now because um, we're sure that peak is gonna be here any time now. But let's look at where that idea came from. Okay, so here is from my favorite, data website, which is ourworldindata.org. And here are the curves for India, for the United States and the United Kingdom. So it was the peaks that India and the United Kingdom reached that convinced people here in the US, oh, well, the peak's gonna happen anytime soon now. So this line here I'm following, this is the India curve, the surge, so it went up and it hit a peak and it came down. So these are the number of cases per million people. But probably because of lack of testing in India, the actual numbers were maybe 10 times this. And, but the point is that you only, that you did see this peak and then it came down. So there's some speculation that, that, that the virus ran out of people to infect and infected so many people in India. So then the UK, all right, so, so thanks to international travel, this Delta is spreading around the world and it gets to the UK before it gets to Hawaii. And um, so here is what the UK, what its surge did. Um, and it reached a peak and uh, at, the, at the end of uh, the beginning of July, about like the second week, of, the first week of July, and it came down and a lot of people said, okay, well, the peak is over in the UK. Ah, but then look what happened. It's going back up again. So it didn't just have a peak and then it's, you know, game over for Delta. Delta is still there and, it's, and now it's growing again in the United Kingdom. And so the, the people are trying to figure out why did it go down? And it's because uh, school let out and also these uh, soccer games that, uh, are the, the motivation for lots of people to gather and party in bars and pubs, uh, they ended as well. And so the numbers came right down. But now people are, again, their contact networks are reconnecting and the cases are going up at quite a sub substantial rate. So this brings us to the United States curve. So it, it didn't start going up until uh, later in June. And here it is, so you can see it's not as steep most recently as it was in the beginning, but there's no indication that it's turned around and it's coming back down now. 
And so putting your hopes that the peak is just around the corner, well, that's you know what uh, they used to say after the stock market crash in 1929, prosperity is just around the corner. Well, it would take another 10 years in World War II to finally uh, fix the, e the economic depression. So I wanna highlight a few interesting features here uh, of the, of Hawaii, of the, uh, the Delta surge in Hawaii. So these are overlaid graphs. The yellow is a graph of the hospitalizations in Hawaii, number of people in the hospital at any one day. The blue bars are the number of fatalities. And what I did is I took those two graphs and I tried to line them up. So the blue bars to line them, get them lined up with the hospitalizations to get the fatalities lined up with the hospitalizations, I have to shift it over about two weeks because the deaths uh, follow hospitalizations by about two weeks on average. And you can see the curves line up pretty well throughout this whole from, from May um, of last year. Well, this is, this is the entire pandemic, okay? But with the Delta surge, starting in late June, the number of hospitalized pulls way, way, way ahead of the number of fatalities. And that's a very good thing because we don't want these blue numbers to be following these yellow numbers. That would be catastrophic. And so, um, and remember most of the, and that's not being caused, this is not a, a, um, a product of the vaccinations because something like 88% of this yellow curve is unvaccinated patients. Okay, so this is something it's, what's probably happening is that it's a lot younger people that are now getting hospitalized and they don't drop as far from the, um, from the uh, COVID infection as the older people that were hospitalized back in the, um, in the winter peaks. So, um, so let's hope that, all, that these blue cases are truly prevented and not merely delayed. Um, so this is, but this, is our, this is our peak. So this is you know, almost off the chart here. And we notice in the past week or so, it's gotten a lot flatter. And I don't know what's the, the cause of that because it's a lot flatter than the, um, than the growth rate of the cases. But uh, we'll, we'll see what happens with that. So this is another interesting thing in terms of the cases and how old people are with the, in the different age classes. Right now, um, the, this is the number of people in, in each age uh, as a, a, a number of weekly cases. And the, the largest group is the 18 to 44. And just under that is the zero to 17. So these are kids. And if you follow this zero to 17 curve back in time, it, it goes to the bottom here. So it was tied with the 65 and plus uh, during the, um, the holiday season coming that surge, all right? So during the holidays, during January, the, the number of juveniles uh, in, in just infected uh, positive cases was about equal to the number of 65 and plus year olds. But in the meantime, during this Delta, Delta surge, that youth class has, has pulled ahead and is growing at the fastest rate of any of the age classes. And I saw a map showing which states have the highest growth rates in, in kids being infected and Hawaii is, is uh, one of the top of those. So why that's happening, I don't know. But that's, uh, I, I, we just uh, got, got the call to appear yesterday and I didn't have a chance to prepare many, many more slides, but I thought these would uh, be of interest and be germane. So I'll, I can stop sharing unless you have any questions. <clears throat> Uh, I mean, we can have a discussion. You, are, you have any more slides? Nope, that's it. Okay. Can I just say one thing on top of uh, piggybacking to Lee that I didn't mention earlier is that you know, the other thing that we heard with these hospitalizations, and hopefully they don't result in as many deaths, you know, even though we've seen these stories about these cooler storage units, was that I was, we we're hearing from colleagues on neighbor islands that the cases of non-COVID patients 
like strokes, heart attacks that we typically would transfer to Oahu were no longer able to be transferred for the usual care that we would you know, deliver in those higher level care centers. So that another you know, sign that the hospital system is in crisis with all these hospitalizations. And it's a trickle down effect to non-COVID related uh, illnesses as well. Uh, could trickle back to your, uh, the age group slide? Yeah. Uh, could the zero to 17 year uh, rise, could that be attributed to the opening of schools? Well, for, so that for was any, any of any of our experts. I mean, that's that's one thing that is not the same as back uh, last year. Well, if you look at this divergence, it it begins be, before August third. So the the zero to seventeen year old group is pulling ahead way earlier than August third, the opening of schools. So I don't think this data could give that could attribute that, but there. If you look to the number of infections in the last school report, uh, those they were growing three times the rate of the number of, in, of positive cases for the state as a whole. So it's a definite. This is definitely happening. What the cause is, I'm, I can't tell you, but it, but it precedes the opening of the schools. Okay. And then one more question. You mentioned eighty-eight percent of the hospitalizations are unvaccinated. That was one of the questions from from our viewers. They wanted to yeah. know what percentage. That was the latest uh, numbers that uh, the lieutenant governor shared. So, um, in a, in a, you know, it's been growing and I don't know uh, what to make out of that. You know, it started out with like 5% that uh, were, were, un, were unvaccinated, then it grew to 8%, now it's 12%. So, so I don't know what, what the interpretation of that is and if it's gonna continue. All right. All right, well, thank you very much, Doc. Okay. You can, um, let me get back over here. Dr. Evelyn. Hey, so that my part of this is to talk about if we did a stay at home for a time period, what do we hope to accomplish? And it basically, I, I don't know if it was clear in the beginning, but we wrote a paper essentially putting all this information together, why we were concerned, what the data shows, and then what do we recommend? And our recommendation essentially is that there be a 21 day stay at home. Uh, so the questions that are obvious is, okay, what happens in that 21 day stay at home? Why would you do it? And what's, what, would, um, what would you try to accomplish during that time period? So essentially one of the reasons is just what we presented is other stay at homes have worked. They've been able to so-called flatten the curve. And the reason that it's so important for us is our hospitals really are overwhelmed and the idea of running out of oxygen is such a horrible idea. COVID requires high flow oxygen basically to keep these people oxygenated. And can you imagine being like they showed pictures of in India where you'd come into a hospital and there just wasn't oxygen, but we are remote and we can only work with what we have. Yesterday they'd reported that the amount of oxygen being used on a daily basis exactly equaled what was being produced here in Hawaii with those two companies. So that was at a hospitalization rate of 427,000, uh, 427 people. Could you imagine if, you know, we got to 500, which it looks like we're going to what we would do so that the, the 21 days would allow us to one, try to flatten the curve, bring the surge down two, give some rest to our unbelievably hardworking people. Three, the idea would be at this point, it's extremely difficult to transfer somebody from a neighbor island to Oahu because of the um, the census and the Oahu hospitals. That means you come in with a car accident, a stroke, a heart attack, all the kind of things that we would routinely send. The ability to send them has been tremendously diminished and made much more difficult. So it would be a, a way to open that back up again, again. The other thing that we would like to do during this 21 day time period is just work on this vaccination message. Not that it hasn't been worked on, but this, uh, the percentage that are unvaccinated that's clogging up this hospital system, that message has to be gotten out more clearly. There has to be a way to combat all of the misinformation that's out there. And the fourth thing that we would like to do during this time period, this time out, is something called monoclonal antibodies. And I don't know if you guys have discussed that much, but monoclonal, so if you get a vaccination, we give you something in your body that your body makes antibodies against. And most of the vaccinations are make, helping you make uh, antibodies against the spike protein. Monoclonal antibodies are antibodies that we actually give a person. 
and they can do an enormous, a tremendous job in preventing severe illness. Monoclonal antibodies are given before you get real sick. They're actually what Donald Trump got when he was sicker than we thought he was. At the time he got it, they weren't very available and they are available now. But we wanna make sure in this 21 days that they're fully available, that anybody that uh, needs them can get them. And an exciting thing about that is before they've been given IV, they now have a subcutaneous way just under the skin. So we would like to make sure that monoclonal antibody ability is widespread through the state. So that's the 21 days. We also, during that time period, would like to fix some of the issues. So one is travel. You know that we opened up the state to either being vaccinated or having a pre-travel test. That was a mistake. Um, it might not have been a mistake before Delta, but at this point, it's very obvious that a vaccinated person can spread this. A vaccinated person is less likely to spread it. Um, they're less likely to catch the disease. And the time period that they would spread it is much shorter than a non-vaccinated person. But during that, during that short time period that a vaccinated person can spread the virus, they are as contagious as an unvaccinated person. So essentially what we did is here, open the door to these people that came in feeling good about themselves, safe about themselves, and we need to close it. You need to not come into the state without a pretest or quarantine for 14 days, period. It just needs to change and change as rapidly as we can change it. And then there's the question about what do you do when you get here? So now everybody's had a pretest or they're in a 14 day quarantine. The other issue that's known to have caused some of these clusters is residents coming home, say they even got their pretest and they're vaccinated and they feel pretty good about things. They go back to work, they go to school and they're with their families. Unfortunately, not uncommonly, they're infected and they're infecting their families and their workplaces and so on. So we would like something that for at least three days when you come back, whether you're vaccinated or not, if you're unvaccinated, a mandatory quarantine for three days. If you're vaccinated, we would ask people to self-quarantine for three days, not to go back to work or to school for that three days and get a test at three to five days. And if that test is negative, then you could go on. So we would like to um, kind of fix that hole in there. We'd like the DOH to help us also with guidelines for people that return to their homes, residents returning to their home. What, what does it really mean to kind of self-quarantine self for that time period? Third thing, or the last thing on travel is the governor did say to the tourists stop coming and it's actually had a pretty quick effect. That message needs to be reinforced and we need to say at least for 21 days to our residents, if you don't need to travel, stay home, at least for this time period, let us get this little break. Next thing that we uh, tried to address in our letter in just more detail is this whole issue of vaccination, the quarantine in general. So on August 5th, the governor said, um, you need to, if you're a county or state worker or a teacher or a um, first responder that you need to be vaccinated or you need to be tested, I believe it's once a week. That we need to push that effort. Um, particularly in the first responder world. My understanding is that the firefighters, for example, in the county are one of the least vaccinated departments. That's really dangerous. Dangerous for them and dangerous for people that they're caring for. Um, dangerous for them because they're in situations that aren't very well put together when they come to an emergency and they certainly can be exposed. Dangerous to others because if they are um, infectious, they're with a vulnerable person that they're picking up and they sleep together as they sleep in their ships. And that makes that whole, you could take a whole shift out easily with unvaccinated numbers. So our feeling is that um, that proclamation should certainly stay in place, but that the testing should be, we suggested daily, that there be rapid antigen testing daily for people that are in these kind of positions that are potentially so dangerous to themselves and to others to come to work. So again, they would have their choice if they did it or not, but that they the testing would be much more strenuous. Um, and the other thing that we wanted to mention on that is right now, according to CDC guidelines, I'm a vaccinated person. If I had contact with a known COVID case, I actually, it suggested I get a test of three to five days, but I don't need to isolate or quarantine. That's incorrect, I think, with what we know with Delta. I think if you're vaccinated or unvaccinated and you have a contact with a, a known COVID case, at least a vaccinated person should be, um, I think, quarantined for three days and then, uh, or self quarantine at least for three days and then get a test. And if your test is negative, um, then you could be released out. So we would like to actually work on that piece of it. We think that's a kind of a hole in the guidelines. Um, two other things that we talked about is just masking. Um, masking is interesting. Every time I go to Costco, I have to 
hold myself back from being irritated at somebody who's deliberately wearing the mask or around his chin, his or her chin. I think particularly the big, we think as a group, we had said that the masking should be better enforced, particularly in these big box stores. They, they do well enough that they could have somebody that could walk around and make sure that people are masking properly. And the other area that we've understood has been a piece of the cluster has been the back of restaurants that actually the waiters and restaurants have been pretty careful, but the back of the restaurant uh, and the chefs, the people in the back cooking and so on, they're not necessary. And it, you can see why they might not. They, it's hot back there and so on, but they tend to be a piece of the cluster. And a recommendation has been made that there be better monitoring of the back of restaurants. If once restaurants open up, um, that there would be monitoring made by the liquor commission or something, just visits to make sure that at least during this time period, we're trying to put the surge out that the back of the restaurant is also properly masking. Um, and the last part of this is schools. So the schools are opened and we are firm believers that schools need to stay open to the best of our abilities and that Burton County Pediatric, the CDC, and so everybody's right there. What's concerning us is, is the Hawaii Department of Health put out great recommendations for school guidelines, for ventilation, for masking, for how the cohorts work. And our understanding from teachers and some teachers and many parents is that it's spotty how the schools are doing that, that masking can be good in one classroom but not so good in another classroom, that ventilation is really different. Some classes are still using AC and others are opening the windows. These are all secondhand stories, so I don't 100% know how accurate they are, but we're concerned that we've heard them enough. So we believe, this, we said in our, our letter, we suggested actually the schools close for a couple of weeks to put these in place, but that's the issue that we feel at least strong about whether the schools actually need to close. But what we really feel strongly is that there has to be a methodology that there's a, that the DOH guidelines are implemented in the schools. And unfortunately, as with many government agencies, there seems to be silos. There's a DOH and the DOH recommendation, and there's DOE and the way DOE does things, and there isn't enough cross, um, cross circulation. And we would like to make sure that DOH guidelines need to be followed in the schools and there's a way to make sure that they're followed. We actually feel also that remote learning should be a possibility again for families that desire it. There are families that certainly have vulnerable people in their households and they're very concerned that they don't think it's safe enough in the school system and they like remote learning. I think we need to learn. And I've heard that there's some effort actually to get mainland remote learning classes that we could use here. But I think that should be an option, remote learning. Not that we would be pushing it. If we want people that could be in school, be in school, but that it'd be an option. It also would unload the schools and allow better um, distancing. Um, and the last thing that I want to talk about just briefly is on schools is testing. So um, private schools around the state, many of them anyway, are doing surveillance testing once or twice a week. In California, every school in their school system is doing surveillance testing once a week. And it turns out there's a new department in the Department of Health that's in charge of school testing. I think they've been operational about a month. So surveillance testing um, once to twice to more times a week is very available. Apparently, Kauai is the only county at this point that hasn't, doesn't have any school yet that's in that surveillance system. So, and testing would allow us to know what's going on in the schools. So our effort during this, particularly during this 21 days, is to get the surveillance testing to be robust in the schools. And the final thing I'm going to say is it doesn't look like anybody's going to put a 21 day stay at home order in place in the next two days. And this big weekend is coming up. I think the one thing that all of us can do is to kind of think to ourselves, we're in trouble. Our state and county is in trouble. Let's try to stay with our bubbles, our family bubbles during this weekend, not be involved in large events. Um, there's something that we can each do ourselves. And if, if the state doesn't come around and make a stay at home order for two weeks or three weeks and we ourselves can try to do the best we can. That's the end of my part. Thanks, Bill. If, if I may just expand a little bit on Regeneron treatment, which is the current monoclonal antibody treatment that has the um, EUA. Um, I was in more meetings this week, tw uh, two meetings about it. So I just wanted to expand on it, that it's treatment for vaccinated or unvaccinated cases um, that are high risk, but the definition of high risk is pretty broad. The age is 12 and above. Essentially, anyone who's overweight and has any medical condition would, would have an indication for that treatment. Um, and, but it's also indicated for 
post-exposure prophylaxis for unvaccinated people and immunocompromised. So essentially, you know, a household that was unvaccinated, if they had a case, all the other people that were close contacts could get the treatment um, and we would have, you know, less likely to be hospitalized, which I think is the most important issue right now. There's talk about, I think, five or six FEMA teams coming to Hawaii to help um, offer those services. There are, but there's also discussions about the ability to offer those services through like an urgent care where you would get a rapid antigen test maybe and immediately once you get your result that the treatment can be delivered right there. So I just wanted to mention there's, I mean, there's a huge potential, potential to expand that treatment, not only for positive cases, but for contacts of positive cases who are unvaccinated and at risk. Uh, I wanted to um, then also just throw in my support for Bill's suggestion. I mean, I, I, I'm not going to put this whole suggestion all on Bill. We've been talking about this already about, you know, uh, appealing to um, people about the Labor Day weekend to Im implement our own stay at home order. Um, now, I know that a lot of local residents feel mm -hmm. like some, um, I think, resentment to being told, please do more, mm -hmm. please do more, please do more when we feel like there's been an, uh, and it's your fault, and it's your fault, and it's your fault. Um, and I'm sympathetic to that. A friend of mine um, po made a post and it actually made me rethink the way that I was thinking about the stay at home order. I think the way that we talk about the stay at home order has been like a mandate either from our, our government or we've been pleading with people to voluntarily do it. You know, I've been part of some of that messaging too. Um, but now she was kind of pointing it out like as a protest, we should do this for our people. Um, you know, so she wrote, whether or not Ige is going to claim an official shutdown, he should know that by the sentiments around us, Hawaii is shutting itself down. Let, let us tend to our own and gain control of this situation. So I'd like to throw it, throw it out under that idea. Think about it that way. You know, this is a people shutdown. If our leaders can't do it or don't feel like they have the will or the, um, courage to do it. We should do it. Maybe we can be the inspiration, you know, for our leaders to act um, more definitively. Thank you, sir. Uh, you know, we have been pounding that drum, the personal, lock. I call it the personal lockdown. We don't need an order from the governor. We all know what we got to do. It's in this Charlie said early on, uh, before y'all came on, it's the discipline. You know, it's the discipline of everyone to, to do what needs to be done. To, to get the outcome that we all need. No one wants a lockdown. No one wants, I don't want a lockdown, but I really don't know what else will work at this point. Uh, and you can call it a safer at home. I think allowing people to, to walk their dogs and exercise and get in the water at the beach, all of those things that we did last year that worked, uh, we don't have to deviate much. We don't have to put people in prisons, but we gotta keep people away from, from each other until we can get a handle of this virus. Yeah, I say well, something. Enjoy your ohana for the weekend. <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, Lord have mercy. So, uh, I'm so sorry. You, who, who, Dr. Lee? Yeah, so you, it's fantastic that you've been putting out that message now for weeks. And even uh, when, uh, when the lieutenant governor freaked out when it was like 250 cases, uh, and he said, well, let's just have a two-week, what did he say, chill out or two-week pause or something like that? Mm -hmm. nothing happened and so everybody's been saying please you know please be careful please do this please do that and well we we're not exploding as we were nine days every doubling every nine days we're doubling every 33 days so maybe it's made a bit of a difference but it's not going to be a different enough of a difference to stop this growth and to and to shut down our medical system that's why uh, you know the only the only thing that's worked in the past has been the stay at home order. Dr. I, mean, I just want to repeat, um, you said it, Mel, but it's very important. The, the very first stay at home order we had had us staying in our homes, no outside activities. We know that's wrong. The outside, right. we're so lucky in a way, we have trade winds, we have beaches, <laughs> outside activities, as long as you're able to socially distance. And particularly if you are more careful to be with your own family bubble, they're safe. And so any kind of stay at home order we're talking about, it's not excluding. It, it means that you can go outside uh, to walk your dog, go to the beach, as long as you're not congregating. 
um, Oregon has gone to outside masking again, but what basically what they say is mask when you can't socially distance. And I think that's not a bad guideline. If for some reason you're outside and it gets more crowded for some reason, you might consider a mask for sure. Um, but in, if you can socially distance outside, we're so lucky to have a nice, to have this wonderful outside here. I mean, a better uh, name I, for it I, might be a, a stay outside order. <laughs> I have a question for the docs. So say, for instance, we do the 21 day, we drive the numbers down. It always seems like there's this pogo effect. It'll go a little while, then boom, it starts going back up again. It seems like this go around, when it started to get a little bit scary, it, it doesn't appear that anything was done to really squish it or squash it or whatever you want to call it. So how do we propose to prevent that pogo effect, right? We get the numbers down, everything looks good. Everybody is high-fiving, yeah. Then all of a sudden, complacency sets in, bingo, boink, that thing go back up again. They were right back where we're at. So I keep on saying one thing, and that is, you know, if you don't have the discipline, if you don't have the drive, because sometimes this, this whole defeating this ugly thing will take a good year or so. It's not going to be 21 days. I mean, we can bring the number down and everybody feels good about it. But what about when it starts doing this again, start going back up? Uh, do you folks feel we need to, the, the state or the Department of Health or whoever needs to jump on it really fast? So we, you know, because when it got into the community, it got to a point, it's just totally saturated. Where do you go? I mean, how, 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 do, you, how do you wrestle this? You know, how do you wrangle this, this big gorilla now? It, it's just, it just get, it gets too wild. Well, when, you, when you get it down to a certain low number, then the, the contact tracing has a chance to stay on it. Right now, the contact tracing is completely overwhelmed. And so that's one advantage of getting the numbers down to keep and keeping them down. Now, if you looked what, what happened with our two previous stay-at-home orders, after the first one ended, the first one now, that was like two months. And after it ended, boy, that's, the cases started going right back up again until we had that summer surge. But when the second stay-at-home order ended, the numbers didn't go back up. In fact, they kept going down slowly. So I would love to know why. Was it because of the tier system restrictions or was it because people learned to be careful and maybe <laughs> got used to being, uh, being socially distanced? I don't know. I, I would love to know the answer. But the UK, after they had their huge peak and it came way down, now it's that pogo you were talking about, Charlie. Um, mm -hmm. Those numbers are going back up. Yeah. So I, you know, a piece of what we talked about is these things that we would try to put in place during this time period. So making the schools safer, we created this huge hole in our travel system where we said vaccinated or free test that needs to change. So we can plug up some of these holes um, for sure. Uh, better masking, uh, this issue of returning residents coming home and feeling so confident that they're fine. You know, we could make that a lot stricter where you know that you may not be fine. You need to get a test in three days. And so there are ways hopefully to fill in the hole. The other thing, um, what's interesting is, you know, before Delta, it looked like we were winning. We, had, we were close 60 to 70% vaccinated and it wasn't, we didn't have a, a variant that was contagious as Delta. Delta has exploded it on top of the fact that we had done a, such a good job that we didn't have much natural immunity here in the state. We really just had our immunizations. There is a possibility that Delta rages through the, particularly the unvaccinated population more quickly than the old variant was doing. And we vaccinate more. So if we get our vaccinations up to 75% or so, and we have it raging through that population that's still so vulnerable, we may find that our natural level at some point, if we don't have a new variant, and that's a real if, but that our natural herd immunity ability is closer to where it needs to be. The sad thing is we used to say 70% would give us herd immunity. With Delta, they think it's more like 90%. It's so much more contagious that you have to get a greater number. So I'm hoping take the load off the hospitals. We can save our hospital system, do these things we need to do over the 21 days, and Delta is going to rage through it as it's going to, that maybe we can start to see the end of the, end of the spike. But it's just a hope. Well, if I can comment too, I think Charlie, you bring up a point that Tim Brown has brought up that 
it seems like we, our leaders, and a lot of us want to think that each time that COVID improves, all right, this is going away and we're going to go back to the life as normal. And it's unlikely. You know, I mean, that, that we're probably not going to have these huge surges. We hope we're not going to have these huge surges, but we're going to be dealing with COVID for years. Um, and so I think the measures like that Bill went through, or Lee Evelyn, sorry, went through and shared, you know, those are those small preventive measures that I was kind of mentioning that, that we shouldn't be scared to implement as needed before these surges get out of control the way they do. You know, I always like this stay at home order or stay at home idea for, for Labor Day, I'm always reminded of um, the story about the Philadelphia parade that occurred during the Spanish flu, which was a horrible decision, but it, it and it created a, a ton of cases and a ton of deaths. But it always reminds me that there can be small decisions, relatively small decisions that are made that create huge differences in, in, in the outcomes in pandemics. And it's hard to know which one of those decisions is going to make that big difference. But I think that our leaders and, and our people, we, sh we should get used to it, that we shouldn't be scared to do that. And I think we need to accept that we're not just going to be able to go back to life the way that it was before, um, before the pandemic. You know, Dr. O'Carroll shared with me today about something that I didn't know about Hawaii and influenza. So, you know, influenza now looks like, you know, um, JV COVID, you know, <laughs> it looks like it's, it's, not, it's not nearly as bad. But I didn't know this, that Hawaii for the past from 2015 to 2019, Hawaii was either the highest mortality rate in the United States or the second highest mortality rate in the United States. And when we were second, we were second to Mississippi, who was also getting was getting slammed by the Delta variant. Um, and at least the explanation that the Department of Health gives is that we have um, a year round influenza season, um, partly because of high volume tourism. So, you know, that was, wow, you know, but it made me really realize more that Hawaii, the way Hawaii operates there, even, you know, oh, and vaccination rates for Hawaii, we're middle of the road. We're pretty average. We're a little bit above average for the United States in 2019. Mississippi was sixth to the bottom. So, you know, we love to get really, really high vaccination rates. I've been working on that, you know, for the past six months or more you know, uh, spending a ton of time on it. And I'm, I want to keep working on it. I, you know, I hate to admit it, but I feel like we failed. You know, we didn't get to the level that we needed to, to prevent this from happening. And, and you know, I, I feel bad about uh, it, but, uh, you know, we failed, we failed, uh, you know, everywhere in the United States. I wish we could have done better. No, you know, you know but, no, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you straight up. You, you didn't fail. It's just the attitudes of the people out there. Because I've seen it. I've seen it firsthand. There are those that are compassionate in what the message you're trying to get out. And there's those that just don't give a hoot. And if you try enough times to try to change the mind of those who don't give a hoot and they don't want to change, what can you do, right? Is that, is that certain freedom of choice? And sometimes people make bad choices. That's why sometimes people just end up in prison when they make those bad choices. It's the same thing. But I think from what I've been getting from those who have attended your, your pop-ups here and there, Dr. Capono, it's been worthwhile. So I think you got to give yourself that much credit. Give yourself that much credit. Thank you. And, you know, I mean, I know it's a partial success. I just mean that we didn't get to, we were hoping to get to these high enough rates that we'd be protected from this. And, and we did. Um, but, you know, I think what we're learning is that, you know, with the example of the flu, it's very difficult for Hawaii because of, the amount of travel that occurs to keep an infectious, you know, infectious disease like that um, out of our islands or from having an impact on our islands. And so it's probably going to continue to happen at, lo at lower rates. And, and we need to be thinking about all the measures that we can employ in the future to prevent it from becoming a surge like this that puts our healthcare system in crisis. Before anybody else says anything, I, I want to capitalize on what you just said. So if it's known that it's this this industry, right, that a lot of infections come in, how do we address the standoff? Because we're going to be damned if we do it or damned if we don't. If we cut the head of the snake off to save, you know, from, from having this infection spread again, yet we're going to be hurting businesses that depend on this, this type of business, right? So it's, it's a catch-22. I mean, how is this juggling act 
going to take place. I, I keep on toying with it, and I'm a, I'm a simple-minded guy, but I get frustrated too. I said, it's so simple that it's just not getting anywhere. Well, let, let, me, just, let me just say, right now, right now the crisis is, is the hospital capacity, the oxygen, all of these things. That, that's the crisis right now. And, you know, we, we need to do something now. You, you said it earlier. I think Dr. Capono said it. If we, if we knock this down, or I can't remember which one of you said it, if we knock the thing down and if we do the actions we need to do to keep it at a manageable level, then we don't really have to fight with tourism. Are we? But we're not doing that. We aren't. The floodgates are open. We do not touch the tourists for anything. We allow luau's to continue. We allow the visitor industry to, to, to thrive. And people are, have this, this impression that if we're going to lock down, everybody's going to lose their jobs again and the business is going to shut down again. But, but why aren't we thinking about the hospital capacities that we all know are at a crisis? Right? We're at a crisis level right now. The other thing, one simple thing that I don't think would impact visitors and visitor industry and tourism and, is the pre-travel testing. So if we do the, the stay-at-home order, to get this down 70%, 75% to a, to a manageable level and reinstate the, at least the free travel testing, vaccinated or not, I don't care. Everybody can carry this thing. I'd love to see the post-travel testing, the arrival three to four days afterwards, you get another test. But by that, you know, that pre-travel testing, you know how many, how many people, they get the test, they get their positive, they cannot board the plane. Or they're not feeling well, they just move off. They move the vacation because they, they have a good feeling that if they go get tested, they'll be positive. At least we'll keep some out. But, but to do nothing and to allow that gates to stay open and to, and, to, and to expect these numbers to drop without any type of mitigation other than scolding the people and telling them we're going to give you a ticket if you get congregate over the Labor Day weekend, it's not going to do it. The idea to coexist is to be able to have the mitigation measures in place on a regular basis so we can keep it at a level manageable so that we can, this, this communities can survive. And that's what I'm not hearing from the state, from anybody, from the counties or the state. Everything is based on tourism. And, and then they, they paint this picture that the tourists have absolutely nothing to do with the surge of, of, of this virus. And I disagree. And it's, it's the travelers, not the tourists, but the travelers. So I think number one, we got to knock it down basically to open up the hospitals again so people can get their heart stuff and their take care of their car accidents. We, we can't do that right now. And then we got to figure out a way to implement the mitigation strategies to keep it at a manageable level. That that's that's what needs to be done. I don't know. Thanks for letting me vet, but I I'm reading some of the comments and some people who I will not lock down. I will not lock down. Well, you know. That, that's fine. That's your choice, I guess. Maybe you'll get a ticket. Maybe you won't. I don't know. But how else? Any other suggestions or solutions? I'm open to hearing. I think, I think one. I wanted, th oh, go ahead, Lee. One thing that people should keep in mind is the the first lockdown was over two months long. All right, that that was radical, economically really horrendous. The second one was only two weeks. All right. And that's what it would take to get the numbers, you know, in half here. And that's not going to destroy the entire economy. Uh, the first one was was for you know, over two months. That's really, um, you know, very, very destructive economically. But two week is not the same and it's not forever, but it would get us out of this crisis in terms of the hospitals. Dr. Capono. Well, I wanted to piggyback on what you said, Mel. And, and one thing I think that gets glossed in translation sometimes is that, um, you know, even if we conceded that most of the spread from travel was returning residents making poor decisions, it's still the reliance on tourism that makes our leaders reluctant to implement the testing, you know, or the, you know, the mitigation measures. And so that's where, I, you know, like, even if that argument was completely true, 
it's still that dependence, you know, that is, is, has us in this position where the governor is willing to ask people not to travel, but not implement any travel protocols that are focused on safety. So I, I think that that point needs to be, needs to be made. I'm disappointed that people are, are so adamant about saying that they're not going to lock down. Um, and all I can do is, you know, I tell it like the patients that don't want to get vaccinated at this point, you're indirectly hurting people in the community, people that need access to hospital care, you know, but by, by making these decisions. And like I said about that parade in Philadelphia, you never know what that one decision is, you know, that can be made that has huge ramifications down the line. And right now, you know, a, a, a number of small poor decisions could have huge ramifications because our healthcare system is at maximum capacity. So, you know, like I said, I'm not trying to tell people, you know, listen to me because uh, I'm a politician. <laughs> you know, I, I feel that same way about leaders sort of saying that and then not willing to take action. If it was up to me, I would, I would take more action too. But I think there's all, you know, like we were saying, you could take your family bubble to you know, local spots that hopefully aren't going to have a whole lot of, you know, overrun crowding there and, um, and have a good time this weekend. And it's the best thing that we can do if we, if we don't do a stay at home order. I, the other thing I wanted to clarify, I think a lot of people don't realize that a stay at home order from, you know, that was mandated would automatically affect travel. I think a lot of people think that that would only affect, you know, residents, but then visitors would be allowed to do whatever they want. And that's not the way I understand it. So you know, that's not what we're, what we're calling for either. Um, so I understand people are tired of it, but I, you know, I, I see it as, as, you know, at this point, it's a protest to stay at home. You know, I mean, it's us doing, doing what we should do for each other because that's, we care about each other. Um, and I hope it, it helps it get, get through to our leaders. Anyone else? <clears throat> You know, I think people got to understand lockdown is a horrible word because it, 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 you know, infers that you're locked down. And I think, you know, the ability to go out and get takeout, the ability to walk your dog, exercise, all that, like I said, it's no different than what we did in the past. Emotional health, mental health is, is vital as well, especially during this pandemic. So we cannot confine people to their homes. But the fact that we won't have those gatherings, one of the other thing, I know we're running out of time, we're actually, we're over time. But one of the things that's bothering me to no end is, is the churches, the places of worship. Uh, today we saw in the Kauai cases, two new clusters, places of worship. They, you know, the Department of Health will never release the names of these places of worship, but they seem to be a, a common area for, for the spread of this virus. And, and again, doesn't get mentioned, it's exempted from, from all of the regulations and the rules. Uh, for If we wanna get a handle on this virus, then we're gonna have to treat everybody the same. And everybody, everybody's going to have to do their part. Uh, not just tourists, not just residents, but businesses and establishments as well. Or else it's going to be very tough to beat this thing. I, I don't know if you guys want to comment on that. I just thought that was pretty interesting when I saw that in the report today. Nope. It's a huge source of frustration for back dealing yeah. with, you know, trying to get people vaccinated. And I, I'm not sure what what else I can say about that. I, I have conversations daily with people that I think get impressions that they shouldn't based on messages they get through their um, churches. And I wish it wasn't the case. I hope that, I mean, I spend a lot of time today ordering testing for people that I, I believe were informed by church leaders about vaccinations. And uh, I hope that something that can good that can come out of this surge is that it convinces more people that they should get vaccinated because it's going to touch more and more of the people that we um, care about and love. Yes. Dr. Lee. I want to make it sort of a general remark. So I think a big part of the problem of where we are now was that, you know, back in May, <clears throat> we were, we were really deluded that, the pandemic was coming to an end in America. All right, this was, you know, meanwhile, it's ex the Delta ex is exploding in India and then in, in the UK and epidemiologists in the United States knew it was gonna get here and it was gonna be very, very destructive. But, uh, you know, in the infosphere, it was like the pandemic is, is almost over. I mean, 
if you if you go back and review the the announcements uh, from the leadership here, oh well, you know we just gotta get a few more people vaccinated, we can get rid of all of the restrictions and we'll we'll be back to normal. And then all of these plans were made around that without any plan B, without any backup plan. So part of that was opening, reopening the schools. If you had told somebody in May, all right, we are gonna reopen the schools in the midst of the biggest surge of one of the most contagious viruses known to humanity, does this sound like a good idea or not? Nobody would say, uh, yeah, let's do it. Let's go for it. All right. The problem is with the delusion that the pandemic was almost over and not paying attention to the variants and the, the evolution of, of the virus, uh, they went ahead and made these plans with no backup plan. And now they were committed to it. And so they're trying to push through with this commitment to this previous plan to keep the schools open. So, of course, it's a good idea to, um, to, in per to have in-person learning. But I don't think anybody would have argued, yeah, we should do that in the midst of the, the biggest surge yet in the pandemic. So the problem is commitment bias, all right? So everything is being conditioned. It's like throwing, throwing uh, good money after bad. You know, when people in the, in the stock market, they bought a, bought a stock and it's, it's not doing well, but they're afraid to sell it because they've already put in so much money. So there's a kind of a psychology, a commitment bias. But... Um, you know, it remains to be seen. Uh, this one of the things, at least, that a, a stay at home or stay outdoors or a stay away order or whatever you want to call it would do for two or three weeks would give the schools time to ramp up their periodic testing. So they have a plan to, to ramp up um, regular periodic testing of the students to detect COVID. And, and I should mention at Duke University, um, they just had their first week of classes and they discovered that one out of 20 students was infected with Delta and they didn't even, and most of them had zero symptoms. And so if you're trying to track based on symptoms, you're not going to catch any of them. And so they had to radically revamp their, um, their plans. They're still going to try to stay in person, but they're letting, uh, much more on go online after that experience. So, um, we're in, we're, we're in a mess because people were deluded that the pandemic was over. They didn't make backup plans and, and they're trying to stick to the plans that they had made. But I think, you know, one more semester being closed would give time, time for the vaccine to be released for kids. And this would make an enormous difference in terms of the number of kids that are going to get infected. And um, so you know, what's, what's one semester in the, in the life of a whole person? That's the, that's the, the trade-off that I think of. Dr. Ebsen? I'm gonna close on a totally non-scientific basis. <laughs> so we've, I've spent my life immersed in medical science, but basically when I think of the churches, you know, the place of worship and the problems with their clusters, which is across the country and I'm sadly here on our island too, I keep thinking one, the, the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, is full of plagues, plagues that were sent to people and the people didn't listen. Mm -hmm. So I kind of think, mm -hmm. open your eyes, you know, look, we're being sent climate change and um, on, you know, on remitting climate change issues, fires and hurricanes and, and this plague, real plague, and we're not really listening. And two, if we were given anything by any kind of creator, it was the, we were made smart enough to try to take care of ourselves, to put clothing, how to make food. So we were given some tools. We were given immunizations and we were given masks and they, the science behind them is, is extremely powerful. And to throw away those tools, the things that were given to us by our, our abilities that we perhaps a creator give us, gave us, and not to be listening to these plagues is beyond, I can't understand it. There's nothing in my body that can, in my mind or body that can understand that reasoning. So I close on a non-scientific basis. <laughs> That's how I'm closing. <laughs> That's a pretty good one. Dr. Capono, any closing thoughts? Uh, well, you know, I'm gonna come on next week with Ka'ohi, uh, Dr. Dangakiona, who's been focusing, you know, on testing and, and vaccinating on Big Island. Uh, 
or Moko Kiave, Hawaii Island, whatever you like to call it. I know some people don't like to call it Big Island. Um, the thing that, yeah, you know, why I think I'm a little, I get a little bit more emotional other than that I've just been working a lot is that this surge is now, you know, touching our native Hawaiian community more than in the past. We're now overrepresented as far as cases um, during this Delta surge. Um, so, uh, you know, th that gets to me the most, you know, and, and that's part of why there's a lot of talk that, I know there's a desire from vaccinated people to say, we don't want to be punished for doing the right thing. I hear that, you know, but I, I still feel we have to care for the unvaccinated people to do it the best thing that we can to keep them safe and prevent hospitalization, you know, from hospitals from overloading. And that's why the shutdown right now is the best thing we can do. I hope the, those people, you know, the parts of my community that have been hesitant are going to get convinced more. Um, but I'm on that side that we still have to care for these people who have not made the decision that I wish they would have ahead of time. Um, and the shutdown or the stay at home order, you know, or separating, whatever you want to call it. Maybe I would just call it, you know, Ohana Labor Day <laughs> weekend, but that's the best thing we can do right now. That's the best critical decision that we can all make. So I, I really am pleading for people to do it. And I, I feel like you people that don't want to respect authority, that's a good way to not respect authority <laughs> because right now the authorities are not doing what we think that they should do. And that's that stay at home order. So uh, a lot to everybody. And, you know, and I hope that we, we keep that, keep that in mind and don't lose our, um, I guess, don't, don't let that reserve run out. Thanks, Doc. Charles. Well, first, I'd like to say thank you to all of our guests tonight. I think it was very enlightening. We, I, I think, you know, Mel, and to our guests, I think we've come through that, that, that critical junction at this point that, you know, if we think about it, Kauai has been through many devastating you know, hurricanes, you know, I mean, devastation. And people have lived through that. So I think there's a there's lot, lot, lot of people out there that, that believe in seeing is believing. And so every time you get a close call, they go, whew, we missed that one. But then if you get enough close calls, what happens is you start to build up this resistance of taking precautions. And, you know, like I, I tell my wife, we had a close call, but yet we still react as if it was a direct hit. And then you, you just count your blessings because it didn't hit you square in, the, square in the face. And I think that's what the danger about this whole thing is all about, is that, you know, I can only go back and think of my brother. I, I You know, there's, there's not a day goes by. I wish, I wish he was alive today. He didn't have to be taken by this COVID. But now, you know, if I had to look at it back then, Delta wasn't around. So, you know, he, he was just taken by the, uh, the regular COVID. But look at all these people that are suffering now. And, I, and I, I plead with the people out there, is that what you want for your loved one? I don't think you want that. You need to do something. We need to all do something. And again, you know, this show is about just getting information out there. And if you don't want it, you know, I saw... I saw some comments tonight, kind of negative in a sense that, uh, yeah, they talk about the protest, then, then fine. But at the same token, you know, we, we all got to watch how we walk and how we step and who we are in this community. If we are community leaders, and, and everyone on the screen here is a community leader, Dr. Evelyn, Dr. Arthur Burden, especially uh, Dr. Topono, we have to walk and conduct our lives in such a way because we live up to the expectation of what people expect and we do our best. And one of that is you, you took an oath to help people because that's the, that's the profession you wanted to get into. And so I think, you know, when they, when they speak from the heart of what's happening now and what they're trying to tell you folks out there, I want everybody to listen. You know, they, they could have been doing anything else tonight but they decided to come on and share with all of you. 
So I just hope and pray that you know you take you take what they say and take the time to digest it and really, really look at what's happening. Because if we'll be a small part of the equation to get this virus under control, but everybody gotta do their part. As long as there's a weak link, none of this is gonna work. None of this. So I hope and pray you folks follow what the experts have said, what these gentlemen have shared with us tonight. Thank you, Mel. Thank you, sir. And uh, yeah, trolls get booted. I, I blocked a couple tonight. Um, you know, they come on our show. They don't want to be on our show. I don't know why they come on our show. So I don't know why Nana, why, why Nani Lee or whatever. Bye-bye. We'll never be on our show again. Stupid. Make stupid comments. Anyway, um, what you guys can do, if you enjoyed or appreciated the information tonight, every one of you out there, viewers, share it. You can share this after the fact. It's on YouTube. It's on Twitter. It's on Facebook. Um, the best thing you can do is, is share the, the feed, whether it's our Facebook or YouTube, and share it with all the news media, Hawaii News Now, KITV, every PBS, whatever, CNN, I don't care. But we got to get them, we got to get the mainstream media to start sharing some factual information that we, we get to share thanks to our friends that come on our show. But share it with everyone. We got to get this information out. <clears throat> Senate hearing tomorrow, the Senate COVID committee tomorrow, 10 o'clock. Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Chiba, phenomenal. Uh, from UH, we'll put out the numbers for our committee, uh, Senate COVID committee. Please, please, please tune in. You can watch them on the YouTube, the Senate's YouTube channel. Or if you just Google Senate, Hawaii Senate hearings, uh, you can go straight to their, their streaming page. And I'll just close with this. You know, life is precious. Charlie knows firsthand, all these doctors, they all deal with people getting sick and dying on a daily basis. I would think that, I mean, I hate to think that it would take something like that to happen to one of our leaders where they lose a loved one uh, to finally realize that this is, this is not the flu. This is not something that's minor. It troubles me when I hear people minimize, you know, desensitize. They'll post up all the numbers, oh, blah, 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 blah. They do their report. And then at the end, they'll say, and the Department of Health also reported 12 deaths or eight deaths or two deaths at the end, which that should be up on the front. Life is precious, guys. And uh, we have an opportunity to at least do a little bit to, to curve, this, curve this thing. And that is exactly what the doctors are saying. Do it ourselves. We don't need a governor's order. We don't need a mayor's order. We can do what needs to be done. Let's just try it out over the weekend and see what happens. Anyway, guys, again, docs, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Tomorrow night, seven o'clock, we got Dr. Jerome Kim. Um, he will be sharing some updates on the vaccine world with us. And uh, that one, you don't want to miss that one. All right, guys, you guys all take care. Stay safe. God bless. We love you all.